Hello everyone, you're very welcome to the first webinar in the Dublin GA Coach webinar series. Before we get started, um, my name is Owen Mooney, I'm the Learning Games Development Coordinator with Dublin GA. I'm going to go through a little bit of housekeeping before we start. So as you can see on your screen, um, please turn off your mic and keep it off throughout. And please turn off your video and keep it off throughout. And you've already done that, so thank you for that. You'll also see, please use the Q&A function if you want to post questions. So on your screen, you will see a couple of couple of pictures at the top and you'll see two speech bubbles with a question mark in it. Please use that if you want to pose any questions. If you want to use the chat function, you'll see a little speech bubble with two straight lines across it. Um, Donald and Mark will be posing a couple of questions during their webinar. So if you want to use that for any comments and to answer any of the questions that the lads pose, that'd be great. And also the final part is the session has been recorded and it'll be available at a later date. So in relation to your own network and your own Wi-Fi, if there is any lags or any issues, please don't worry about it. This will be recorded and you'll be able to come back to it at a later date. Um, again, because you've uh, signed up, you've given your permission to be recorded. So if, if you don't want to be seen, please keep your video off. Um, we're now going to hand over to the uh, Director of Coaching and Games Development with Dublin GA, Ger O'Connor. Uh, thanks a million Owen and uh, thanks everybody for tuning in and uh, joining us for this first webinar. Uh, I hope that you're all keeping well and not too disappointed that uh, you haven't been able to get out onto the field. I suppose through connection, through co collaboration and through innovative ideas, we can embrace these challenging times and find opportunities to grow as coaches. Sometimes we're so busy that we don't get an opportunity to actually reflect on what we're doing. So tonight, um, this particular topic planning is quite topical uh, in, re in relation to when we will get back to the field. Uh, because there's no physical coaching happening at the moment, maybe only remote coaching, this gives us a good opportunity to see how we can plan better for the future but also how we can look back at the things we've done and maybe learn from those uh, those practices that we've had. So I'm delighted to, uh, to welcome our two presenters tonight, Donald Doyle. Donald is a native of Wexford and has been working with Dublin GA for a long number of years. He's a regional development officer for South Dublin and um, is a member of the St Vincent's Club. Also, I'd like to welcome Mark Brennan, who's a native of Carlow um, and has been uh, senior player both for the hurling and football in, in Cardo for over 10 years. He's also the GPO in Kula and has spent a lot of time in this whole area around planning and periodization. So I'm going to hand you over to the lads now and I hope you enjoy the session tonight. Thank you. So you need to unmute your microphone. Sorry, thanks very much, Owen. Sorry, folks, um, the age old mistake there of leaving yourself on mute. Um, as I was saying, my name is Donald, and I'm going to um, just start off here um, on this topic um, on this webinar, a guide to planning your coaching, and then Mark is going to take it up around halfway through. Um, so what I would ask people to do is if you could just grab a pen and a piece of paper um, for one or two little tasks along the way um, that we might get you to get you to do to have have it close at hand. So as you can see there in front of you now, um, the objectives for tonight um, were to highlight some guidelines for planning. Um, everybody has their own take on planning and hopefully everybody does some type of planning and hopefully maybe we'll give you some ideas around to you know develop that further uh, going forward. Um, then the possibility of using the game to guide your planning. And so just a little bit of a look at, you know, an option that I suppose we've talked about and that I, I use myself a little bit um, as a way to kind of, I suppose, frame your planning or structure it going forward. Um, and based on that, then maybe what a six to eight week coaching plan would look like. Um, and then Mark is going to kind of pick it up um, as regards um, 
designing a session plan and looking on, looking at a session plan also over a six kind of six week program. Um, and then in particular, he's going to kind of dive in a bit deeper into maybe some activities you could use for particular topics you might be working on um, within your plan. So, you know, mine is, I, I've, when we talked about this, Mark and myself, I suppose we, like any coaches, uh, Mark has worked with teams, I've worked with teams, um, everybody has their own little bit of a way or their own kind of style. Um, and again, Mark is going to have a little bit of a different twist on, I suppose, what he's what he's presenting to an extent. And is, as I was saying, um, these are just these are just options in some ways, you know, for people to kind of uh, develop their planning or to think more about it. Because we do have that thing where sometimes we kind of we do first or we coach first and then we maybe think think later. And um, so look at to, maybe to get into the habit of kind of thinking first about what we want to do, what we're trying to develop um, parts of the game and obviously develop players and then, you know, do it and then then review it. So you can flick on to the next one. Mark is in control of the slides uh, for the moment. Um, so looking at just kind of four pretty basic kind of guidelines as regards um, how you might think about your planning and particular think about how you would plan your your coaching sessions. One looking at you know player engagement. We'll go into these in a little bit more detail in the next slide. Um, that idea of who you're who you're coaching and two then you know, coach behavior. So that's your own coaching style, basically. What kind of behaviors you're going to use during your coaching, uh, depending on what you're trying to coach. Um, what kind of session objectives or session focus you have for your coaching sessions, more to do with the kind of the, the what of coaching. And then the the practice structure or the session structure, how you would, how you, how you, how you go about maybe, you know, some ideas around structuring your session, how it would look. Um, from warm up to, to kind of cool down at the end. And the whole center of that really being that idea of, you know, plan, do, review. Even if you have that kind of template in your in your mind or in your practice that, you know, you plan it, you do it, you get out on the pitch and you coach, and then you review it afterwards and review the good and the bad and what went well and what didn't go well and, and so on, you know. So you want to flick on again, Mark. Um, so just to look at it in a small bit more detail, um, Again, it, it's very much underlined about the plan, do, review method. So looking at the first on the left there, the session objectives, um, you know, that it's based around really around the player, player appropriate, the age of the player, the stage of the player, the ability of the player. And that's, you know, when myself and Mark talk, that's a key thing. I suppose one of my biggest learning experiences recently has been kind of working with, you know, at juvenile level with, with um, a kids team from kind of, you know, under under eight to now under 13s, under 14s. And, you know, experience is, is a great learner or a great teacher uh, at times, and you can learn a lot from from it. Um, looking at the practice structure then, you know, how are you going to structure your session? That idea of, you know, are you working on a single skill or multiple skills? Do you want to use condition games or just small sided games? And then what type of conditions you want to use on the games and the effect they might have? And then types of practice you might have be it skill practice within your session, you know, opposed or unopposed. That idea of block practice where you might, you know, very much heavily focus on one skill uh, in different blocks of time with a lot of practice or, you know, variable or random practice. That idea of mixing in different skills, you know, with random uh, random distances of passing or stuff like that to vary things up. Um, and then the whole sequencing, how your session flows, you know, from warm up to what activity comes next, then what activity comes after that, that you have some idea of flow in your session, depending on, you know, the numbers and uh, all the, the equipment and the space and the facilities you have. So, you know, how your session kind of looks and um, before you go and do it and will one activity flow easily into the next one if, if you're the only coach taking the session right through. And then your coach behaviours. Um, so that's your looking at your own style of coaching. Now everybody has their own style, and that's you know that's important. And everybody you know should be themselves when they're coaching um, and coaching their own way. But looking also at the idea of you know what kind of do you want to use question or how much you know things like encouragement, observation, instruction, demonstration, uh, feedback, and then you know problem problem solving or problem setting. So the idea of setting you know setting problems or setting the tasks. For the for the kids or the, the players to, to solve um, and then the final one around player engagement that idea of maybe looking at you know how does your session look as regards 
you know, player time on task? How much time do they spend actually, you know, doing stuff, you know, playing, practicing compared to maybe standing around and stuff? What's their activity time within if it's just an hour? Because a lot of people or conscious would be operating, you know, maybe at juvenile level in Dublin, you just have an hour on the pitch. How can you get the most out of that, out of that hour? Um, and to be very much aware, I suppose, that I'm kind of looking at very much a development level and um, that idea of maybe, you know, 11, 12 to 16 um, with, with these type of ideas. Then looking at player involvement, you know, how, how involved the players are in the session, how involved they are in the decision making of maybe what you're doing or if you're trying to progress activities or make challenges more difficult, the idea of maybe asking the players, you know, how could you make it more difficult or how could you make it harder if it's too easy and vice versa if it's too hard. Um, and then, you know, on getting talking to them about understanding why they're doing what they're doing. And then, you know, the key 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 thing in, in player engagement is know the players, you know, going back to being player appropriate, you know the players better than, than anybody else. And what kind of works, what works for them to keep them engaged. And that might be that trade off of, you know, doing a certain amount of games, certain type of games and getting a mix of skill practice as well. And um, so just before Mark clicks on to the next one, just go back for a second, Mark, please. I'm just going to ask you to get your pen and paper ready. We're going to show you the next slide and it has, it has a line of letters on it. So we're going to give it 10 seconds to look at the slide and then Mark is going to flick back to this one. I'm going to ask it to um, try and memorize what's on the, the letters on the slide. So just flick on to a mark there for 10 seconds maybe. So you see the line of letters there. Um, so just have a look at them and in about three seconds Mark is going to flick back. You can flick back now Mark please. So try and write down as many letters as you can that were on that slide on the, in the second line of the slide that were all jumbled together. Okay, Mark, I'm going to flick on now to the, and then to the next one and hold it there. So this time we give you 10 more seconds to look at this one. Look at the, the, the second line again. Okay, Mark, just do a double flick back there again, please. This time, write down how you get on on the second slide. So what we're looking at here is is the idea of um, basically breaking up breaking up large chunks of of information. So if you want to flick onto the second one, Mark. So you can see in that one there, it's the very same letters that were in the first slide, where they're all basically jumbled. They were all just closer together um, but because they're broken up into you know segments or things we recognize like you know JFK, VAT, NASA, whoever, um, who, NATO, FBI, it's looking at the bigger picture and it's easier to kind of memorize and um, you know manage things so it's that idea of you know maybe looking at the elephants and trying to eat the elephant easiest way is to eat it bite by bite. bite. Um, so this is looking again to say that the bigger picture of using the game maybe to guide your planning. Now, you know, some people I know do do this, not everybody. Uh, it's something that I think I find find helpful to kind of plan going forward. So I want to flick on to the next slide, Mark. So when you're looking at the bigger picture and particularly I think with that youth development area of kind of 12 to, to 16 or minor even um, and using the game to guide so it, it's a simple, I suppose, philosophy of all invasion games, you know, to break the game down into into the two moments of attacking and defending. And even to take it out there, like if you're going to the session or on a, on a particular night and you didn't have a chance to plan, if you're saying to yourself, look, you know, I'm going to do a warm up, then afterwards I'm going to do something on attacking, and then I'm going to do something on defending, then I'm going to bring them together in a game, and then it's to cool down, and you'd pretty much nearly have, have a session planned in your head there just to go with those two moments. But if Mark flicks it onto the next one, so just to add another layer to look to break those two moments down into the principle, principles of play. And again, you can adjust these into what you believe the principles of play for, for attacking should be. And we've kind of gone with Gaelic football here just to, just to put, a, to put a, a code on it as such. So, you know, in attacking that can be move the ball forward, keep the ball, create chances and score. And that can be very applicable to you know kids from 10, 11, 12 years of age upwards. Um, and then in defending, you know, press the player on the ball or tackle the player on the ball, win the ball, defend your goal. So immediately there you have you have six principles of play, three in each moment to kind of think about, you know, think about the, the game and what 
areas you could be covering in your in your coaching sessions. So you can flick on again, please, Mark. Um, and then just to add another layer, you know, this is where I suppose the skills um, where we decide to bring the skills in and what skills apply to each each principal player. So Mark, I'll just flick it on again. Um, and very simply, you can add more to these. This is a very basic kind of level to look at, you know, if you're moving the ball forward, the simple ways of doing it are, you know, to pass, fist pass, kick pass, catch, carry, solo, bounce. That's as simple, simple as it is. Um, and within that, you know, you can see where, where the different skills fit into the different principle of play, and that links back into the attacking. And this goes into where we had earlier about the player engagement into why, because kids nowadays will ask, you know, why are we doing this? Why do we need to do this? We're able to kick, we're able to pass, whatever. You know, that you're saying, right, we're working on moving the ball forward and moving the ball forward quickly. And, you know, this is what we're working on in this game when we have the ball and we're attacking. So you're trying to link the skills to the principles of play back to the, the major moment of the game and they can see hopefully how it how it fits together. So just to flick on again, Mark. And this is, you know, this is a very basic, you know, eight week uh, game football coaching plan for, for any underage team that you could work on. In week one, obviously you have your two moments of the game. Now you could do both of them on the one night or you could have, you know, attacking on a Tuesday night, defending on a Wednesday night, on a Thursday night. Um, your principles of play that are connected to them and then the skill set that's connected to that principle. So again, if you're looking at week one and it's attacking, moving the ball forward, you might say, right, we're just going to work on, you know, um, carrying the ball, solo and bouncing tonight and your game is focused around that. And you might have some practice activities focused around that as well and um, between your games or after your after your games and then try and bring that into the game if that's something that you want to focus on. You know, players carrying the ball forward and being confident on the ball and stuff like that. So again, week two, you know, you move down into the two opposites again of attacking and defending. What you know, the idea if you have the ball, trying to keep the ball, and if you don't have the ball, you're defending, trying to win the ball back, and the skill set that's involved involved in that. And again, week three, you're moving on to creating chances and scoring. You know, shooting, taking on the defender, and then defending, defend your goal. And block, your, block the shot, stay on a goal side. So these are all things, and you can add in more layers in the skill set because there's more things to be added in there. But if you're pitching this, maybe you know under 11, under 12, really what you're trying to do is you're, you're trying to teach them, you know, teach them, teach them the game or facilitate them learning the game, I guess. And then in week four, you know, something you could add in is a review or reactive week. There might be something that was you know very bad at one or two matches wasn't working well that you want to particularly focus on or you just want to review something you covered over the last couple of weeks and then you know the next four weeks you're back into the same cycle again and mark could just flick on and i just a kind of a i suppose an overview how that would look and the, the idea behind the, the learning involved in it this idea of a kind of a spiral coaching plan it's essentially the same thing again week one you have your two topics one attack and one defending and you can relate your skills to those you know, week two, you move on to the next one. Week three, you move on to the next one. Then week four is your reactive week and you're building on top. Uh, you're starting off again at week one. Um, so the whole idea that, you know, you're at a development age or development stage, learning takes time. You know, there is there is really no rush. Um, so we can get a little bit caught up in, you know, that something was so bad last Saturday and we really need to get that started. And that's fair enough and sometimes you do. But, you know, learning does take time, um, particularly at those age groups, because it can be a little bit all over the place at times. And then we all know about the 10,000 hour rule or the 10, 10 years, you know, that takes a certain amount of time for that, for the for, for to develop expertise. And that idea of, you know, learning is cumulative, uh, as in learning builds is best when it builds on what is already known. So when you've covered something in week one, those topics, you revisit them again in week five. You revisit them then again in, in week 12 or whatever it is. You revisit a second, a third, a fourth time. You know, the players will pick up more and more every time they'll add to it. Because not every player will learn everything the first time or the second time. And different players will learn different things, hopefully, you know, and they'll improve at different rates. So just the next one there, Mark, I think this is a, and this is just a, this is something you can look at after when Owen puts it up. Just some games based around, you know, defending, um, and attacking those principles of play and how you might set it up in the first one, pressing the player on the ball, you know, the condition you might use. Again, you could you could take this framework and you could build in your own content into it. 
the challenge, have a go, you know, winning the ball back in the opponent's half, the reward, if you do this, you get, you know, two points or whatever. So you're really focusing on, you know, even under 12s or under 13s or 14s, that idea of tackling the minute they get to lose the ball or the ball is turned over in, in, in the opposition half, that they're really engaged and trying to win it back as quickly as they can. Um, and then the last one, on or Mark, sorry. So this is just a very basic outline of a, of a session planner that might go with that might go with that um, idea of using the game. Again, you know, at the top you just have your basic bits and pieces, which week it is, the days, the equipment, your session objectives. Then obviously they're coming from your your moments of the game, your tactical tactical and technical elements are added together, and your game moments say it's attacking, your principle of play, move the ball forward, and the skill you might have to decide this week or this session that is kick pass and. Another reason that could be catch, catching or whatever it is, or it could be bought uh, again in defending. And we haven't really got into um, the idea of adding in, you know, psychological or social or, or physical um, um, content really, really into it. But again, you might have something you want to focus on, and there be it speed as regards physical or psychological. It might be concentration or something, you know, and to focus on that and to talk about that with the kids during, you know, some of the activities they're doing. And then the content and the structure, just to give give some ideas on, on how how it could possibly look. You might have you know your quick uh, pre brief at the start, or you might do that after the warm up. You know sometimes you're better out just getting them out, getting them going, getting them warmed up. And then the different coaching behaviours you might choose for the different you know different activities, whether it's the game, the follow with the practice activity by another game, and you might have another practice activity in there. But again, you can break it up whichever whichever way it suits, and that'll be dependent on your numbers, your space available, all that kind of stuff. And then at the end, you know, on a part and part, you mentioned it at the start, that idea of plan, do, and review. Very important to to, to review, you know, to review your your uh, your session at the end. What worked well, what didn't work well. You could even add another column in there for the different activities, you know, or even you know, write it on the back of the page or whatever it is, or on a new page or whatever that you have that then for the next time you're you're coaching that topic and you think oh yeah that worked really well when we were doing kick pass that night or that week or whatever and you might work with that and um, that's my my lot for the moment guys i'm going to hand you over to mark there down in the sunny southeast now he's operating from uh from carlo so um, i'll let mark click on thank you thanks very much donald uh, i hope everybody's able to, to hear me okay um just to give you a quick background um, on myself, as I'm sure a lot of you are not familiar with me as you would be with the other guys. Um, I did my uh, Exos coaching mentorship with um, over in America through the Exos company. And then I went on and I worked in Harvard sports department for a while before I came back and worked. did my, my master's in, uh, in Carlo, where I uh, focused on game demands and positional demands of inter-county players. <coughs> um, and to be honest with you, I'd say I'm far from an academic, but uh, I definitely am obsessed with sport and in particular GAA and, and sports performance. Um, so really over the course of the next 20 odd minutes, uh, I just hope to tie in what Donald spoke about into a more practical session of what we were able to maybe bring to the pitch on a Tuesday night. Um, I suppose I will kind of uh, suggest and just hope that you're aware that this won't cover everything. You know, there's an awful lot. There's a massive topic coaching planning, um, and this will only touch on a, a one part of it. Like it would not cover elements like the art of coaching or player relationship and planning communication, which are, as we all know, are absolutely crucial. Um, but this, uh, you know, I hope if you can get a little bits and pieces out of it, as we all try and do from these webinars, um, we're trying to be aware that this really is from under 10s up to, to adult level. Um, you know, it might some of the stuff might sound a little bit sciencey or complicated, but hopefully by the end of it, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them and I'll try and explain it a little bit more detail. So really, as I said, you know, if we have a principles, then we can create our own methods. So what we're trying to do over the course of these next few slides is to understand how to build a framework, which is really just a template as Donald spoke about. Um, how we can align our games and our activities to that coaching plan. And then by the end of it, I'd hopefully I can go through maybe how we might progress and regress some of the drills that we're doing. Um, 
so once we have that framework, and this is pretty simple, really the framework is just your template and Donald give you a, a good one there. If you're a new coach, you know, and you're unfamiliar maybe with GEA and coaching, just grab a, grab a template off, off the website somewhere. And really you, all you're trying to do then is maybe just pepper in your own activities around that. Once you get comfortable, you're able to adjust that template to your own needs. And then by the end, you know, as I said, after a while, you might be able to create your own. Um, you may be able to take out some of the elements that you don't need, maybe put in some ones that you think are more applicable to you and your team. So from here, then we move on to the activities and what are we actually going to put into this template? Um, Donald spoke about the moments of the game and obviously the big ones are really attacking and defending. They are the two key moments. So what we're trying to do is break that down into a little bit more bite-sized chunks, more manageable situations that we can actually coach. Um, you know, if, if we have the ball, as I said, that would be probably an attacking moment. Um, there's lots of options then that we might choose. So we could be like a, trying to coach the kids to be more direct with the ball. We might be trying to coach them to be a bit more, more motion, or maybe we're even trying to coach them overload if we're working with more of a high level team. When we're defending, again, this is just basically about how we're going to get that ball back in our hands. So there's lots of options we can do that. Um, we can go press, which is really just a man to man. Maybe we can go a plus one. Maybe we can go a plus eight if you're that way inclined. Or we can go rotational, which again, a little bit more high level defense. Um, now I will say on this, is this this model, um, you know, we uh, we speak about the, the kind of the game model approach to, to training. And this is a little bit different from that. Um, the game model approach is really a little bit more tactical where we have an idea in our head of the tactics we want to play and all of our drills and that are aligned to that. What I'll hopefully go through here is a little bit more, um, more technical game model approach where we're not trying to focus overly on the tactical because I feel if we, sorry, overly on the tactical because I feel if we do that, particularly when we're working with kids, you know, we're actually trying, might be putting a, a pretty low ceiling on those athletes. So as much as we can, we're trying to develop those these players technically, get into their absolute technical ability. And as they get older, then that game model approach will become a little bit more easier to, to coach into the players. And we have a lot, lot more app, um, a lot more options from a tactical point of view. So again, really just to go back over what I was saying there, like what we're trying to do is reverse engineer the plan. So we have this big plan in our head and we've got to break that down into smaller chunks. Um, we're looking at you know, what skills are being executed. If I had to go back and I was, okay, I'm deciding now I want my players to be better at pressing the ball or I want my players to be um, more aggressive in taking on their opponent. Well, I need to understand what skills are exactly uh, executed in that. Then I need to understand what is the most appropriate way to learn these skills. And finally, how close to the actual scenario can we make it? So I'll go through this in a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides, but really we're going to decide on an activity we're going to go through the 70% rule, which I'll explain in a moment. We're going to have repetition into it. We're going to have a little bit of variety. We're going to review it then. And if they're getting better, or if we feel like the activity was not aligned to them, then we're going to change the activity and we're going to continue that cycle. But obviously, as we always get asked is, why are we doing this? You know, why not just play the game? Isn't that what will make the players um, in terms of that's what they want and that isn't the game the most uh, effective way of training them and to steal some um, some clips here from Shane Mangan and one of these is on a team that I'm working with at the moment this is um, if you can look at that for a second there you'll be able to see the possessions that each player has um, from both males and females and how many times they actually touch a ball in a game obviously what will jump out at you there is from the ladies point of view if you're in the full back line um, you're not only going to be touching the ball maybe nine times in a whole game. But at the other end of it then, if you're maybe a midfielder, you'll be touching the ball 17 up to 25 times in a game. Again, that is a lot compared to your full backs, but in theory, it's actually not an awful lot of touches of the ball. So we could make a strong argument based on this, that actually the game itself might not be a very good way of actually training our players and improving their technical ability. So that is why we try to need to go back and align our activities in order to get the, the athletes more volume. So here I'm going to go through a, a sample session maybe that I just came up with. Um, we're going to look from a defending point of view, okay, and I'm going to focus now for the next six weeks. I want my players to become more, uh, more aligned with press defense. Um, and our attacking point of view, we're going to focus on our direct running. I want my players to be a little bit more aggressive taking on their opponents. 
So from there, then I have to ask myself, OK, what skills are involved in this? And we need to be specific when we're asking ourselves this question. It doesn't matter whether we're working with senior inter-county or working with under 10s, OK? When we're being specific, and I mean, if, for example, maybe you're kicking a ball, there is a huge difference between if you're kicking a ball from a standing position and you're kicking a ball maybe on the run across your body um, to an opponent or over the bar. We, on the outset, when we're looking at that from a distance, those two skills might look quite similar, but in actual fact, those two skills are extremely difficult or extremely different. So the player who's maybe wants to become better at kick passing the ball um, might actually not get a, as might not be as more as efficient as they're learning that if he's just standing kicking the ball from a standing position compared to the pair who's actually on the run kicking the ball. From there, then we have to ask ourselves um, what drills and games can we align to this? And again, maybe if I use an example, maybe of, OK, we're practicing soloing or I want my players to become better at soloing. Once they have a certain level of competence and soloing in a straight line, um, for example, might not actually be doing any good for that player. Um, there isn't en enough um, to degree of uh, difficulty in it. And again, if we're bringing it back to a game, it might not actually be very applicable, particularly if we're looking at our players to take on another opponent and him soloing in a straight line is not actually going to help him too much once he is competent in actually soloing the ball. From there, then we got to go into the 70% uh, rule. Again, this is a lot of research done on and how we actually learn skills and skill acquisition. Um, basically what they came up with in, in, in layman's terms is that if we can design a drill and there's a 70% success rate in it, that is pretty much the sweet spot in order to how to learn and develop a player. So again, maybe I'll use hurling now, for example, if we're trying to make our players better at catching the ball, okay, um, we're finding games, the manager decided, okay, our players to keep dropping the ball and it's passed from either through a strike or a hand pass. So what we do, okay, manager might decide to line up the players on, on a line, one player facing the other 15 yards apart and they're striking the ball back and forth to each other in the hand. He's watching that drill going on for a couple of minutes and all of a sudden he notices that nobody's actually dropping the ball here. Um, there's a 100% success rate. So we can then basically deduce from that 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 drill in itself is not actually doing anything for those players because there isn't enough challenge in it in order to stimulate um, some growth. And obviously, there isn't enough failure in it in order to motivate them to come better. So if those players continue on with a drill like that, and when they go out to a game, you can be pretty sure the manager is not going to see any improvement in these players because the game itself and the activity is not aligned to the specific game. Finally, then, we have to, uh, enough repetition to create adaptation. And this is a, is a crucial part of it as well, that we can actually design nice drills and they can be very fancy. They can actually have our 70% rule. They can be aligned with the game and they can have the skills involved. But if there is not enough volume there in order to create that adaptation, then the player will be very, very slow in developing. So if you're looking at a drill, OK, and you pay, maybe pick out one player and they maybe only touch the ball in this drill maybe two times in one minute or one time in a minute, something along that those lines, well, then you've got to ask yourself a question is this, is there enough volume in this drill in order to stimulate some growth? Again, we can, I found myself getting caught at that sometimes as well. So maybe we can uh, change the drill up, maybe split groups up a little bit more in order to get that repetition and get that volume in. Finally, then, I think the most important thing is, as we all know, we have to ask ourselves, is it practical? So are, is the session and the drills that we're um, coming up with and which I can put into our time, are they practical? Will they work on a, a wet Tuesday night? Um, maybe if you have not got enough footballs, if you have not got enough coaches, um, maybe you haven't got enough players even. So again, it's just important to, to remember that. It's kind of, obviously, you might suggest it's very obvious, but it's something that I still keep making that mistake at times. Um, I'm more focused on coming up with nice drills rather than actually making them practical. And that is the most important thing. So when designing the plan, um, Donald showed you kind of a, an individual session plan there and how he had filled, it, filled out some activities into it. That is absolutely fine. We can also maybe go a weekly session planner or we can go maybe a six weeks in one. Um, I have done all of these. They all work very well and they all have their own pros and cons. For me, um, at the moment, I usually try and tie in my four to six weeks into just basically one A4 sheet. I know that might sound a lot, but I'll try and go through it in a minute. I find that this is just the, the best way in order to, to help me maybe be a better coach around the session um, because of my, all my other coaches were, were able to um, have this session in their hands 
we got used to the drills, we got used to one another, we were able to set up the session a little bit um, more early and I was able to maybe focus a little bit more on that player-coach relationship. So I'll just let you go through, this is one of my um, session templates that I've done up, um, I'll let you look at that for a moment before I go through it. I will say it does look a little bit more complicated than it actually is. So as you're looking at that, I'll just say that I would have had sat down with my, my coach and team um, maybe a week before or whatever we would have decided to start going back training or if we're in the middle of a session where we decide we're going to go into our next training block, we would have all come up with, with this plan. Within it, you'll see an awful lot of games and, and drills that I'll go through in a minute. And this would basically, if we wanted to start this, you see the period is from February to March, I have up on top. We have our focus one, which is our individual and plus one defending. We have our focus two, which is taking on your marker and finishing. Again, there's, these are just generic um, folks that I put in there. You can obviously put in your own, more applicable to you. And overall, this would be, these are our main coaching points that we want to help the players develop over the next four to six weeks. So here we can get a little bit closer and I hope you're able to see this okay. So as you see, there's not a lot of real fluff to this. It's fairly simple and hopefully practical. Um, we look at our intensity and we see, again, we want to build that up from low to medium. Underneath that, you'll see our activation and mobilized drills. And then we'll see our neural and mobile integrate and our technical skills. Again, don't worry about the headings here. They're all just fancy terms for really just warming up different ways. Under the activation and neural and technical skills, what I'll do is I will pick two out of those exercises each training session. So I'll pick two from my activation, we'll go through those, then I'll move on to my neural, we'll pick two from those, and then I'll move on to my technical skills and I'll pick two from those. Each one of those six drills underneath those headings will all be in line with our focus. Um, so any night I come to training, I can just pick out two of those and they will be still in line with our focus and they'll also have a little bit of variety in them, but not so much variety that we're losing, we're moving away from the actual, the main thing. And that is the crucial thing, trying to keep the main thing, the main thing. Underneath that, then you'll see some speed work. Again, I won't be going into that in too much detail tonight. Um, it's a little bit outside of this scope, but I think Brian Cullen is going to be having a webinar in a couple of weeks and he will go more into the strength and conditioning side of things. After the speed work, then you'll see that we've, we've moved from our medium up to maximum intensity. Um, and then we go down to our small sided game. So at this point, our players should be ready to move into some individual focused games. Um, their intensity should be maximum out at the moment. So again, underneath max, you'll see an individual focus games. Then we move into blending games and game specific games. Again, we have six um, options under each heading. And again, each night I will pick two out of those and uh, we'll run through them. Underneath the focus, individual focus games, you'll see that this is a little bit more technical based. So there'll be one v ones, two v twos, maybe go into a three v two. Um, overload, depending on the level of players that we're, that we're working with. This plan in itself will probably work for maybe 15 year olds up to adult level. If I was working with maybe an under 10s or under 12s or 11s, the principles wouldn't change. And that's the crucial thing. Of course, I'm going to change the games a little bit, uh, maybe regress some of them, bring them down to a little bit more, um, obviously down to kind of the, their level and the level that they're at. But the most important thing is the principles of what I'm trying to do here don't change. The individual focus, as I said, will have a very technical element to it. But then we move on to the blending games, which will start to add a little bit more players. So we'll be moving slightly away from the individual technical because the players won't get to touch the ball as much. Um, but they will still get to touch it more than they would in an actual game. And then we move on to our game specific type drills, where again, we move, might go into a 4v4s, 5v5s, maybe up to an 8v8 8 8 8 if we're that way inclined. But the most important thing that we need to understand here is that this is these are game specific, um, but maybe that's a little bit misleading because they are still a little bit away from the full game, but they are getting there. We're, we're trying to, we brought the game back down to maybe our 4v4 situations and we're trying to build it back up to the actual game. So you'll still have an element of enough touches. Each player will get a decent amount of touches there to keep them engaged. There is a little bit of a tactical or maybe a we'll call it a more of a game specific element to it where they're getting used to playing with teammates and um, and that rather than a tactical element um, and that in a sense will, will will lead us on 
to some technical skill development drills, which I'll show you here. So again, these are only some examples that I, I've pulled out. Um, hopefully it'll play in a couple of seconds. If it doesn't, uh, Owen and Donald will, will put them into the group chat. So you'll see on the left hand side, we've got a 1v1 game here. So there's an awful lot of volume of players taking on other player, which is our focus. We've got a defending 1v1 defending game, which is one of our, obviously our other focus. On the right hand side, then you'll see we move into a 2v2. Similar situation, it's just, it's a little bit more game specific, not overly. You've still got a lot of volume. Players are touching the ball an awful lot. They're still working on our focus, which I want my players to be more com comfortable taking their opponent on. But also we're still defending pretty much 1v1 in a 2v2 situation. Again, these are only examples. You can tweak these games, and I tweak these games the whole time um, to make it a little bit more interesting. So you can maybe attack the goal from a different angle. You can narrow in the pitch a little bit if you want to maybe lend itself to the defence, having a bit of more of a chance to actually get some good tackles in. You can overload. You can stick in a 2v1 if you're working on certain traps. There's so much you can do with these games. From there, we move into, we can move into, should I say, either a 3v3. Um, again, this should play in a couple of seconds, but this is where we may go into more blended games. Um, still, an awful lot of volume. Players will touch the ball an awful lot. They still are working on our focus. On our left hand side, we've got a 3v3 situation where once you attack, once you lose the ball or score, then you go into a defensive situation straight away. And the ball keeps moving, and everybody's getting a lot of touches here. And this, this can play on for a couple of minutes. On the right hand side, Again, if we're working on maybe more high end teams or if you know you're working and you want to play with an with an extra defender, whatever way you're applied, that yellow player then can stay in and play maybe as a plus one. You can do this with plus two or plus three. It's really up to you. So that plus one would stay in that drill um, for the entire minute. Um, then maybe after that you can change and have a different plus one in there. This can work on more of a defensive point of view if you're looking out working on how you develop some traps how you can help out in your 1v1, but also can help to the forwards who, you know, in typical games these days, it's rarely that you might get a 1v1 situation. So they gotta be used to maybe having, coming up against a defense, which has an overload of players in it. From there then, we can just show you an example of a 4v4. Um, again, this is in line, I think I just wanted to show you this because it's similar to games to what Shane Mangan did in his research. I just want you to, uh, to, to uh, give you an example of these. Hopefully it'll play here now. So up on the top, we have a 4v4 situation with four goals on the left-hand side and then the same on the right-hand side. Down below, we still have a 4v4 situation, but we can turn it into an overload where once the player scores, then they have to run across and join the other team um, beside them. So again, it's just a little bit of a tweak. Again, it's not nothing major. Um, it's just show you that you can do a lot of options and you can change things up within these games to keep it interesting and maybe a little make it a little bit more specific to what you want. And just show, throw some different looks at the players, you know, give them something that they might not be used to be and see how they adapt and see how they communicate to one another. So after that then, and again, these are only examples. This is not an entire, um, I haven't shown you drills I'd use entirely in a, in a training session. We, we would obviously try to do other things as well. Um, below that then, you might have a conditioning element can do it. Now this again, if you're training under 10s or under 12s and 14s, you needn't worry about this. Um, again, you, you it just for my own sake, I usually have it in here just so that if I want to maybe do some aerobic work or an anaerobic work or maybe some go game overload. Um, worst case scenario type of work. Again, this is more so for your, maybe your minors up to senior level type of players. Um, so again, if you're working with underage teams, don't worry about it. The small set of games are absolutely perfect. That's what the kids want. That's what will work best for you. So you don't want to be maybe losing time doing a lot of conditioning work with your underage teams because it might not be the, the, the best, you might not get the best bang for your book. But this, while we are speaking about conditioning, because I know I think we do have some, some um, some adult coaches here. Uh, this is from my own research that I did for my thesis. Just something to keep in mind, as I said, I won't be going into huge detail on the strength and conditioning side of things. Um, if you look at the, the full back line or half back line in your midfield, look at those different lines and then you look across and you look at the total distance that they cover in a game, the high speed running that they cover and the meters per minute that they cover. You'll see that there's a, a huge variety um, in the distances that are covered in games between each line. And this is for an intercounty team. Um, it's an intercounty female team, should I say. Um, 
again, this just goes back to, to my earlier point about how the game itself might not be the best way of developing the technical ability. It also might not be the best way of developing your physical ability. Because if you've got two players and one of them is playing in a full back line and one of them is playing in the midfield line, if they're both of a similar fitness levels, you could argue that every time you play a game, uh, all things being equal, that one of those players is gradually getting unfitter while the other player might be maintaining, maybe getting a little bit fitter. Um, it's just something to keep in mind. Again, I just wanted to, again, while we're on that point, you look at the small-sided games also and how it is important to remember that not all small-sided games are created equal. This is from uh, Shane's research. And again, we're, you know, there is some good research coming out at the moment, but we still only are at the early stages of, of it. Um, I won't go into huge detail here again, but I think it's just important to know that our, our 40 by 20 game, um, Shane showed that, that there was a huge agility element to that game. Again, um, not in terms of relative to the actual game that we play. The 60 by 20 game, relative to the game that we play, that was actually players covered more meters per minute in those games than they did in, in a relative into an actual game. So you could argue then that that 60 by 20 game, if you're just working on fitness, would be a good substitute um, for conditioning in order to get your players ready for a game. But also, I think it is important that we remember that just because we increase the size doesn't equate to more running. That 80 by 20 game didn't actually allow the players to do more running. They actually did less running in that than they did in the 60 by 20. So again, I won't go overly sciencey on this at the moment, but it's just something to keep in mind for all coaches, that while we're creating and you're coming up with your own condition games, Maybe keep an eye on actually what's happening out on the pitch. Um, keep an eye on maybe your, your stronger players. There is some research on these games as well that, unfortunately, like, like everything, your, your stronger players are going to do more of the running. They're going to take over the, the, the game. So maybe have some tweaks to that that you can allow them maybe to not be so dominant. Um, other than that, I think it's uh, to, the main thing is just to try and have that balance. And if any of you have any questions on that, I know I've kind of flew through some of those points you can stick them into the into the chat and i'll go through it in more detail um the key take-home messages that, that we're looking for really on the planning uh, is just the coach behavior the player engagement and practice structure that donald spoke about from my own point of view is really just trying to understand your session objectives we try to break that down as much as we can into bite-sized chunks we try to align those activities then up with the game that we're trying to play uh, and then gradually build the whole thing back up again to the end point. So that's it. And if you have any questions, we'd be more than happy to, to answer. Thanks very much, lads. Um, that was really good stuff there. Um, just uh, there's a number of questions that have come in. Obviously, there's some that are very general in relation to maybe coaching in general, but. Uh, we might look at maybe the one specifically around planning and if we get time we'll try and include the more general coaching ones um, there's a question here from from paddy cairns and he asks how do you know that our players hit the 70 percent sweet spot so mark you might maybe take that up as that it was uh, uh focus yeah it's 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 a tough question to, to answer because my simple answer is just by eye really um you know it, it is difficult particularly as you get a little bit more technical with the, with the drills um but it is more manageable with, with the underage teams because a lot of times you're you're doing kind of closed drills with them so if we're working on a drill maybe in what might be a simple drill like 2v2 facing one another and you're working on soloing one player is running to the other soloing the ball if they're able to do that every time without messing up the ball then i would say that drill is too regressed for those players and we try to move it on a little bit more but if we're maybe we're working on higher end athletes and we're looking on more of a say for hurling and we want to do maybe a motion type game where we're trying to play that ball through our hands and striking the ball 20 30 meters if we're trying to design drills around that and every single time we do that, the ball is just hitting the ground and the, there's no flow to the drill, well, then we maybe need to pull that back a little bit more and try and do maybe 1v1s, which are on the move. So we do 1v1s as we're moving around the pitch, striking at the hand 20, 30 metres, then I build it up a little bit more, maybe where we add in another player. Um, but to really just answer your question, it, it is difficult, but it's, it's really just that coaching eye that you're looking for. 
Just um, thanks very much for that, Mark. Um, just maybe a question here from from Theresa McIntyre, and I suppose it's more of a, a general one, but it fits into the, the planning because obviously you have to plan the time within your your own training session to allow this to happen. So Theresa asks a question: At what age should cool downs be introduced into training? She says that I used them at under twelve, but it seems as if uh, if some under 14 downward don't really ne necessarily seem to to include them as part of their warm down and is it a case of just letting them off at the end of the session is over so maybe your thoughts on that to who of you yeah um I, I i'll go first Um, i think it's i think yeah at kind of under 12 under 13 i think it's really important to bring them back in at the end of the session and to kind of get into that habit and that's one thing i've learned that we, we hadn't been doing and kind of regroup them at the end um, and even if they're in small groups like if the coaches are working on groups of tens or whatever to bring their group back in and maybe just a little recap on what they did or what and ask one or two questions um, and I would say like you know if you look at other sports and things and gymnastics and stuff obviously they're huge on stretching and stuff I do think uh, you know under 12 under 13 yeah you know, just to introduce them to the idea of you know, a light, a light bit of stretching, only two or three minutes at the end, and um, because it takes them a while to get into, and the first couple of nights you'll do is half of them will be messing, half of them will be pushing the other lad over or whatever, but at the same time, it's to get them into the idea of doing it, because those of them that be watching senior matches and stuff, they'll see seniors doing it, and it's, it's good practice, and a lot of other sports, particularly gymnastics, will be doing it a lot, a lot earlier, and do a large amount of it, but, you know, there are varied opinions on it, but maybe Mark wants to something in there as well yeah exactly what yours and there are very opinions on it and uh, you know the, the research is uh, is fairly wishy-washy on it as well um, at the moment so if, i think from a physical point of view i wouldn't be worried about doing certain stretches with kids and that after training you know what i would as donald saying be concerned about bringing them in into small groups and have some little finisher that you do at the end together as a group um, there's loads of little fun things that you can do. Maybe you can pull them off the internet or YouTube, um, you know, just so get the kids smiling and let them understand, okay, that the, the session is over now and you can you can move on your way. Thanks, uh, Teresa, for that question. Uh, just um, a question here, which is, uh, I suppose, quite pertinent in the, in the fact around the planning and also linking that to the player pathway. So the question is, how does the planning approach marry with the player pathway so i suppose what the question here is um do you need to be cognizant of where the player is at in order to uh, develop your planning I imagine yeah uh sure yeah um oh, absolutely i think that's that is the most important thing and that's really hopefully what we're trying to get across is, that is, is the principles never change really whether you're working with kids or you're working with uh, with adults the principles are always the same um, that 70 percent rule never changes that aligned activities to the game never changes it's really just about the ability of the player if your player is not able to kick a ball well you need to bring that back to a little bit more to, to build them back up to the point where they are able to kick it um, the same with your inter-county players if you're working on i don't know your left side or some sort of mass defense you need to pull that all back a little bit more so that we can build it back up again um so yeah it actually ties in completely with your with your player pathway knowing your players knowing their ability is crucial and as you go through those steps you, you'll find that they all kind of work out the same thanks for that mark just uh, from from gordon kyo here uh, gordon asks a question what time would you allocate each part of your session? So obviously the warm up, the small side of game and uh, the, the main part of the game. So what time element would you give to each? We don't really might pick that from. Yeah, I suppose like it's, it's a tricky one because based on an hour, you know, a lot of people have to operate on an hour depending on particularly in Dublin with, with time slots and pitches and stuff. Um, you've got to be efficient, you know, and I think if you're looking at maybe, you know, 10 minutes for a warm up, and then, you know, depending on depending on the, the age of the kids and, you know, what you want to cover with younger kids, you're going to have more maybe fundamental stuff or, you know, physical literacy, literacy stuff. Um, but if you're probably getting a kind of a 50-50 between technical practice, and some type of games, whether it's small side of games or a slightly, a slightly bigger, a bigger game um, within, if you have, you know, 10 minutes for warm up and then maybe, you know, kind of 
50 minutes for the rest of it if you're if you're breaking it down down like that um, because you may have a situation a lot of people could have you know 40 50 kids at their session so they have four or five stations or 10 at each station and they're kind of breaking it up you know maybe it's it's eight to ten minutes at each station and um, but some of those stations could be game stations so it's about using your facilities you know to suit your number as well as you can and actually Perry McDonald and um, give give me a good idea or the GPO is a good idea in one of our meetings you know, if you're if you're on a pitch, particularly in the the winter months or whatever, and you're sharing with three other teams, what works very well, um, in his experience is where you know the three teams come together and they allocate a bigger area of the pitch to use as an actual pitch for you know a reasonably proper game, maybe ten on ten or eleven on eleven, and they all kind of share it for fifteen minutes uh, during the during the, the session, rather than just having their own pieces of the pitch and never being able to really play. You know a proper kind of a game in their training session and um, but it's, it's about getting that bit of a balance between practice and games and um, within it and you can only judge that depending on the, where your players are where your players are at i think thanks donald for that just a question there from eric um eric asks if the objective in running a session is to maximize the number of touches and to run drills that push players i suppose out of the e zone What's the best way to achieve this with a mixed ability group? So maybe Mark yeah. might take that yeah, first. Mark. Yeah, that's that's obviously the you know the big issue that we always have, and that's why I think when we go break things down into our one v ones and our two v twos, um, is the is you know it's the most efficient way of doing it. Um, there is no perfect, you know, silver bullet for this where we can, you know, have everybody working to the to their max. But I think when we find when we do the one v ones and the two v twos, and we we do a lot of that type of work, then you know most players are getting enough touches of the ball to develop. You know, you're, I find sometimes even when we do four v fours, some certain players get lost in that. Even um, never mind when we go into our six v six or eight v eight or a full game. So as much as we can, try and bring it back down. And the younger players. If you're working with under 10s and under 12s, as much as you can, I would suggest try to do 1v1s and 2v2s. Don't worry about the bigger picture. You want to develop those players technically as much as you can. And the only way you're going to do that is if they touch the ball as much as they can. Um, but again, as I said, don't, unfortunately, I, well, I haven't come across the perfect way of doing that. But I do believe fully in that the younger that they are, the more touches they need, and the more 1v1s and 2v2s you need to be doing with them. Yeah, my experience would be would be kind of similar in that I suppose there's no right answer and on particular nights it can work very well if you divide them into A, B and C and it can work very well in their own levels but it but for the for the kind of I suppose the spirit of the group and everything it's good 50% of the time to mix them back up again but you have to get the activities right that they're doing then if you're mixing them back up you know all abilities together Um, but there is you know it, it kind of depends because as much as obviously you want to keep you know the weaker lads coming and keep developing them you can't be holding back the stronger lads either because they'll get just get bored and they'll mess and stuff if they're not being enough they're not being challenged enough as well but and sometimes you'd be surprised you know that that you know see players even at under 12 or 13 they can actually you know they'll really get stuck into it when they're mixed up with the, with the stronger lads as well but there is times that the stronger lads will take over as well so you got to you got to kind of judge that as you, as you see it but there's definitely no right or wrong way or wrong way of doing it Thanks, lads, for that. Just uh, we might take two more. Um, just this one is a, back to the planning piece again. I suppose from an overall club perspective, how would you sell the value of planning to coaches of all ages, where some may <coughs> be doing it whilst all others may not? Um, do you want to take that one, Donald? Or you should start on it, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, whew, how do you sell it? <laughs> to be honest, it should be a pretty easy sell. Um, you know, there is no value in not planning, really. Um, we, like, uh, when I was starting off coaching, and sometimes you'd kind of rock up and maybe try to do a little bit of planning in the car as you're sitting there, or maybe try to do a little bit of coaching off the cuff, and inevitably all those sessions were pretty much a disaster. Um, so I learned pretty quickly that if you haven't got a plan, Sometimes even if the plan is not great, as long as you have a plan and you know where you're moving from one drill to the next and what you're going to do, 
then the players will buy into you a little bit more. And that is probably the end of the day of what you're looking for is the players buying into you. If they don't buy into you, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Um, if they think you're disorganized, well, they'll be, themselves will probably become sloppy. And your sessions will be sloppy and everything will just become frustrating. So, you know, it, it should be a pretty easy sell. You know, any coach in the moment that's going out there now and they're, they're not planning, they're really doing themselves a disservice and, and, and their players a disservice. And then the final question, just I might roll the two into one. So, um, Manus Bramak uh, asked the question, what would you recommend as a good length for a training session? And maybe on the back of that then, what time would you plan between technical drills and games? So there's sort of two rolled into the one, but the first one is uh, Manus's question, just about the recommended length of a training session. Yeah, I think uh, like uh, I think the, the sessions Mark was working on there were working on the, for older age groups are slightly, slightly longer, but I think yeah, you're probably looking at 70, 75 minutes you know, around around there. Again, it can be depend on what's available to you, but if you're lucky enough to have free reign, you know, you can uh, you can work around that kind of time frame. Um, obviously, the younger age groups, you know, the shorter the session, um, but if you're up to maybe 12s, 13s, they're probably okay with that, with that kind of with that kind of uh, that kind of time frame in my in my experience, um, but there is nights you know depending on how it's going you may have to change it up or cut it short or whatever, um, depending on how things how things are going. What was the second part of that question, Ger? Uh, the second part was just in relation to the percentage time that you would plan between technical drills and and games. Yeah, I suppose in my experience that can kind of depend on what your focus is in that, you know, you might have a practice activity that you're doing for seven or eight or maybe 10 minutes max or whatever, and then you want to go into a game um, and maybe uh, you want to, um, you know, take whatever that focus is, whether it's kick passing or whatever it is, and you're going into a game to focus on kick passing. And then, you know, your game could be another 10, could be 15 minutes, depending on how it's going, but if you feel it's, you know, it's, it maybe it's breaking down, or if the intensity, even at you know, 12s or 13s years of age, if the intensity is breaking, you might need to say, right, you need to change this up and bring them in, and maybe change a condition, or you know, make it make a little um, some kind of little change to it, to or else go back into maybe a practice activity or whatever it is. It's you not know, when you I might ask the kids, why do you think it's not as good as it was in the first five minutes or whatever it is, or is there something we need to practice or something we're not doing, and then go back into it, but. It, it's it's about kind of finding maybe what works with your own players um, and what works best. Like most of them will want to play games, and sometimes you can use it as a bit of a carrot. You know that if if the if the, if you need to feel you need to do a little bit of practice on something, and then we can move into the game and have the game for a bit longer. Mark, you might want to add to that here. Uh, not really. No, I think you you've covered most of it there. It's um. Uh, yeah, I don't know really what I could add to that. Um. Most of like after our warm up suggests so our warm up would include maybe a couple what we call closed drills, which are fairly simple, basic technical drills. And once we do that and then move on to a little bit of speed work, sometimes our speed work can include a ball as well. Um, we we'll move on to maybe our so-called games or, you know, whether we call them small sided games or whether we call them just individual focus games. I don't know. It's just really a title we put on them. But I'd usually spend 40 or 50 minutes doing that, and that's as much, I'd like to get at least that much into them as much as I can. I appreciate sometimes up in, in Dublin we can be caught for space and caught for time, and sometimes you're really just given an hour, and that might turn into 50 minutes fairly quickly. So something you just got to, you know, kind of coach on the go as it is, and uh, put as much volume of those games as you can. And... Um, yeah, as to be honest with you, 40, 50 minutes, uh, that's what I, the minimum I'd be looking for. Okay, very good. Uh, thanks, Mark and Donald, for that. Um, I suppose keeping in, in, in the theme of, of the webinar tonight, which is around planning, um, we we set out that uh, the webinars would last an hour. It's just gone over the hour now at this point, so I think we wouldn't be uh, true to our ourselves as coaches or as coach developers if we if we if we plan to go any longer. So I would like to thank uh, both Donald and Mark for taking the time to prepare. Uh, like like any session, whether it be a practical session on the field or a webinar session where you're talking to coaches, it takes an awful lot of time to prepare in advance. And you can see the meticulous work that they did in preparing for tonight's first session, first webinar. 
for Dublin GA. So I'd like to thank the two of them for that. I'd like to thank Owen also for preparing the, uh, I suppose, the logistical side of the thing, the technical end of it, to get the, the webinars up and live. They have, they will be recorded and all the material will be available for coaches to, to check on the Dublin uh, uh, coaching website later on. So uh, I hope that tonight has given you an insight into the purpose of why we plan and the benefits to planning. And hopefully as we reflect over the next few weeks, when we're still not able to go back to the fleet, you might take a chance or an opportunity to see how you can become better at planning uh, for when we begin back out in the fields again, hopefully soon. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Any of you who have signed up for tonight's webinar will, will automatically be included in the links for the future webinars, which will be every Wednesday uh, for the next four weeks. So we hope to have you on again and hope that uh, these are a benefit to you and your coaches. So thank you very much and uh, have a have a nice evening and hope to see you next Wednesday. Thank you.